If we read a book of contemporary Buddhism or go to a Buddhist center, you may have had this experience as well, you'll hear uh, talks of, uh, that include material from different schools of Buddhism. Uh, early Buddhism, maybe mixed with Mahayana, maybe mixed with Vajrayana. It all comes together. And the question for today's video is about this. Is this a good, good thing to have happen? And, and how can we deal with this, this material from different traditions in a skillful way? And you may not even be aware uh, that the material comes from different places. And, and I think we're going to get into some of that too, coming right up. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute, that's onlinedharma.org. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to the channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. And if you're interested in a deeper dive into the Dharma, check out the courses I have on onlinedharma.org. Now, I have a question uh, this week. This uh, video's question is about, uh, from Ray Harmony who asks, uh, I'd love to know what you think of mixing Buddhisms in terms of learning and practice. And this is, uh, I think, a great question. It's one that, that uh, concerns me as well and concerned me because I have an interest in the history of all of this, uh, have some background in uh, Buddhist studies. So this has always also interested me. And indeed, much of what you see in contemporary Buddhism is what I would consider or call syncretic Buddhism. It's a, it's a uh, a, a putting together of different schools at the same time. So, for instance, if you go to a, Z a contemporary Zendo, you may hear material quoted from the Pali Canon, that is, from early Buddhism. Or if you go to uh, a Vipassana or an insight retreat, uh, insight or Vipassana is, is a part of Theravada Buddhism, you, you often will find uh, Vajrayana material quoted or cited. You, you, might, you might hear uh, quotes uh, from the Dalai Lama, for example. And that is sort of a, a, a part of contemporary Buddhist uh, practice, really, at any uh, local center that you go to, and, and many of the most uh, popular and important books as well. Now, I think historically, this is a relatively recent phenomenon. That is to say, if you go back in Buddhist history, uh, for the most part, you would have learned about Buddhism, you would have learned the practices and the beliefs in uh, temples or uh, the equivalent zendos, whatever, uh, and you would have been taught, uh, insofar as you were taught, by uh, monastics. Monastics who were traditionally trained themselves, who would have been trained in the, the important uh, parts of their own tradition. And, and, and so you would have tended to learn almost exclusively the material from one tradition. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't uh, also influence between traditions. That has gone on throughout history. And you, you can't get around that as well. And, and indeed, one of the uh, fascinating studies in early Buddhism, or all of Buddhist studies, is, is the way that we find influences from various traditions upon each other. However, these influences tended to be, in the scheme of things, relatively minor. Uh, rel again, relatively minor, because, again, the, pe the, the general way that you would have been taught and you would have learned was from a traditional monastics who were most... Uh, learned in their own tradition. And so, if you, if you think of Buddhism as a kind of a tree with a, a trunk that then branches, you would have seen these branches getting farther and farther outward, more and more distant from each other as time went on. However, again, in the main. And nowadays, you're seeing lots more of what we might call branch crossings, where, you know, branches even from the farthest ends of this tree end up crossing each other and producing a sort of new ideas that are based upon uh, sort of um, uh, meldings of different traditions. Now, I think much of this can be uh, very useful, and we'll get into some of that, uh, but much of it can be confusing. And uh, for many of us who are interested in the history, uh, one of the biggest problems is determining when you hear something where historically it, ca it came from. Is this something that that came all the way back from the original teachings of the Buddha? Is this something that came up later? How did it arise? Under what conditions? These are kinds of questions. Uh, so we will often hear within Dharma talks uh, uh, concepts that seem, at least at first glance, to be in conflict with each other. We'll hear ideas of, for example, uh, uh, Buddha nature on the one hand, 
this idea that we have a, a, an essence that's that's in a sense permanent within us, and we'll also hear on the other on the other hand this idea of non-self that that the self has no inherent or permanent nature. We'll have uh, practices around uh, meditation and mindfulness. And we'll also have practices around certain kinds of chants or chanting, which is supposed to be, in some sense, in certain traditions, uh, very effic efficacious to uh, whatever ends we're looking for. We'll have, on the one hand, the idea of a single Buddha, who is uh, sort of most important and, and should be looked upon as the father or the founder of the tradition. Or we'll hear about multiple Buddhas, each of whom is, is treated as a kind of a, a, a founder figure. Or a, a multitude of bodhisattvas, which is another kind of thing. How do, these, how do these ideas come together? And even within a single tradition, such as the Vipassana, or otherwise known as the Insight tradition, we have uh, many strains coming up from early Buddhism, and other strains coming from the Abhidharma, which is a later tradition within the same kind of historical uh, strain. So, uh, but before we get into a, a lot of the, the, the history here and, and how we can resolve all of these confusions, I did, uh, I would really love to tell you a little bit about uh, Patreon, which is uh, one way that I help support this channel, uh, which will give you an ability, if you're interested, to uh, get these uh, videos of mine in audio form in case you like to listen to them, say in a car or on uh, on your phone while you're jogging or working out or something, on a commute. Uh, if you're interested in supporting further and, and want to have your name down below in the, in the information box, that's also open to you. I will have uh, occasional updates, uh, sort of behind the scenes kind of updates on what I'm working on or what I'm thinking about or questions that, that I may have, and you can have questions for me as well. And it, it'll help support this channel, which I'm trying to keep uh, advertising free. As we know, many channels on YouTube uh, rely on advertising to keep going, and, and I'm trying to keep this ad free. So if you're interested, do uh, give a look to my Patreon page. It's, it's linked down below in the information box and elsewhere you can find it around. Now, Joseph Goldstein, one of the uh, premier teachers in the insight tradition in the West, has a book called One Dharma, where he basically argues that all of the various uh, schools of Buddhism are unified in their teaching, at least at some level. In particular, uh, he's, he basically argues that they're, they're unified in their teaching, that this is a teaching towards uh, non-clinging or non-identification or non-attachment, if you like. And uh, there's absolutely some truth to that, but it's a truth by, by getting up to, let's say, the 10,000-foot 10, level. If we think of ourselves in the airplane over the, the vast uh, field of the Dharma, if we get up high enough, they do indeed uh, blend together. They, they look very similar. However, if we get down a little bit closer to the ground, this can become confusing. I did uh, a recent video uh, about the difference between the practices of what's called radical acceptance, which we find from uh, contemporary teachers such as Tara Brach, and uh, teachings uh, from the early tradition about escape, where we're, we're supposed to escape from the dangers of the world, that that's the point of practice. And these do seem to be in conflict. Or, as I've just said, uh, ideas of Buddha nature and non-self and many others as well. And these can be confusing. So while it may very well be, as Joseph Goldstein says, that at some, at some remove, at some abstraction, they're all teaching the same thing, still, when we go to Dharma talks, uh, at least if you're anything like me, you will hear different uh, Dharma teachers, or even the same one at different times, uh, teaching things that seem to be in, in direct conflict with each other. And so we have to figure out a way to work with that, if we're gonna, unless we're going to become confused and perhaps filled with doubt which is not a good way forward, we, we're going to have to find some way out of this mess. Now, Bhikkhu Analyo, who is a, a Western monastic and perhaps uh, one of the uh, leading scholars of the early tradition and its history, its development into later traditions, again, that very early part and how it, how it changed, um, he has a, a wonderful video, which I'll, I'll link here and, and down below as well, where he argues uh, about, he argues several things in this video. It's, it's actually a, a conversation, but uh, he has a number of uh, very, very important, indeed critical things to say. First of all, uh, he argues for a respect for the different traditions, that we, that we understand that the traditions should, uh, should be respected and not, 
and not denigrated because that can lead to a kind of uh, uh, a fundamentalism that's not healthy. But at the same time, and I think important for this discussion, is that he argues that it's very important to see the differences. What he says is that we can, on the one hand, see things in black and white, where we become fundamentalist about this is the true teaching and these are uh, false teachings. And that can be a sort of a black and white way of looking at things, which is not healthy or not skillful. But there's also a way of looking at things where we take, as he describes it, the different colors of the teachings and put them all together into a blender and blend them up and end up with a kind of a gray, a kind of a gray mush. And that's also, at least for Analio, and, and I would tend to agree, also not a particularly skillful way of approaching these things. I mean, it's fine from 10,000 feet, as, 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 um, as Joseph Goldstein does, it's fine from that regard to say these are all the same teachings, and so we should, in a sense, respect them all. Uh, but oh, we should also, at the same time, be, I think, aware of their history and their historical development. And so, uh, to my mind, I think when uh, Dharma teachers teach the Dharma, they should be aware uh, when, or I should say, they should be aware of what the material is they're teaching and where it comes from, historically. That is, does it come from the original, or at least the earliest teachings insofar as we know them, from the Pali material? Does it, did they come from a later tradition? Uh, did they come from a different country, a different uh, culture? What were the uh, what were the uh, reasons why that particular teaching arose, I think these can all be very useful things to keep in mind and for any Dharma teacher. Now, some of us will find, I would say, clarity as the highest importance in teachings. Some of us will find that kind of clarity to be paramount. And for those of us in that with that mindset, and I would put myself there, we're going to prefer to have less syncretism in our teachings. We're going to prefer to have teachings that come from a single tradition, more or less, I mean, you know, with some vagueness around the edges, but in general, from a single tradition so that we can keep things as clear as possible. Uh, because insofar as we uh, become syncretic and talk about and, and meld traditions from very different cultures and contexts, we're going to have to do a lot of translation. For example, if we're talking about uh, Buddha nature, for example, which is quite different from the, the idea, at least, at least in first, at first glance, quite different from the idea of non-self that we get in the early tradition, if we're going to make use of these two at the same time, we're going to have to do a lot of intertranslation and talk about the ways that these two concepts are compatible, otherwise we're liable to end up in confusion. That said, there clearly are some great practices in the later traditions, and it would be a shame not to say unskillful, unhealthy, to reject them simply because they, are, they come later on in time. Uh, this is another thing that Bhikkhu Analyo talks about in that video. Uh, that simply because something came later doesn't mean that it's worse. Uh, so for example, many of our uh, practices of loving kindness arose in the fifth century of the, com uh, of the common era, that is a thousand years after the Buddha's lifetime, or at least in some uh, centuries just before that, they arose much, much later. They're, they're later kinds of practices, but they're still good practices for many of us. And so uh, one of the dangers here, when we uh, become less syncretic, when we focus on clarity, one of the dangers that we can fall into is a danger of fundamentalism, of clinging to uh, one particular tradition as the right one and all the rest of them as somehow debased, as some of them as somehow lesser. Now, there are going to be some uh, examples where we may criticize a particular practice or a particular aspect. That's, that's par for the course, that's perfectly fine too, but we should do it carefully and in limited ways, in limited circumstances, without throwing out the babies with the bathwater, as it were. Um, the Buddha himself, I mean, one of the earliest teachings of, of early Buddhism is the teaching uh, which many of us will be familiar with, the teaching of the raft. That is to say that the Dharma is like a raft. It's supposed to carry us across the stream to the other side, but once we arrive at the other side, the, the raft is no longer for clinging to. The raft can be left on its own. We, th that is to say the Dharma is not for clinging to, the Dharma is for crossing with. And so, using that skillfully, we should understand that uh, becoming a fundamentalist is 
a similar problem as uh, simply thinking that they're all in, you know, all the teachings are in some sense uh, absolutely compatible and that there's no problem with uh, mixing and matching in any particular day. You know, both of these have problems. Now, my own approach, uh, which indeed may be yours or may not be, it doesn't really matter to me, uh, my own approach is somewhat different in that, you know, I am most interested in the, the teachings of early Buddhism, which may lead some of you to, to think that I'm uh, a traditionalist in some sense, but I'm not because my take on the early tradition is secular, is a secular take. That is to say, I bracket off aspects of that early teaching uh, which I don't find particularly useful to me. Uh, that is to say, the beliefs of, uh, around reincarnation, rebirth, the beliefs around certain kinds of uh, supernatural abilities that are supposed to come up within meditation. Uh, I don't think that those are useful to contemporary practice, or at least to my practice. And so I set them off to one side. And, uh, but at the, at the same time, uh, I try very much not to, to denigrate the early practices. They are their own thing, and, and some people today uh, practice with them traditionally. That is to say, they accept uh, basically all of, of the early uh, belief and practice. Um, and that's fine too. It just it depends on where you're coming from, uh, where you are in, in your own uh, pa uh, place along the path, and what you find useful. And each of us is going to uh, be in a different place and come from a different uh, history, and so we're going to find each our own way, and that's fine. We don't, we don't, we shouldn't believe that our own way is going to necessarily be the way for everybody else, because each of us is unique and different and has our own uh, worries and foibles and concerns and past and all the rest. Now, if you are interested actually in these history, the history of of, of early Buddhism and how Buddhism developed, I have a a, a a video on the three major schools of Buddhism which I'll put a link to right here in case you're interested. I have other uh, videos on each of these schools individually and other stuff as well. Uh, so take, take a look at that. I, I'm, I hope that you will find it useful to your own practice. And I hope we will also catch you on more of these videos after you've seen that one. And I hope all of you will be well.